Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. On today's show, America hits the debt limit and Republicans prepare to take hostages. The best committee assignments go to the House's biggest MAGA freaks, and they're all ready to investigate Joe Biden's garage. Then, the bulwark Sarah Longwell joins to talk about what's on voters' minds, and later, we'll find out if Democrats are coming to take your gas stove in a new segment called I'm About to Myth Bust. Man. <laughs> Thank you, Olivia Martinez, our producer, for coming up with that title. All right, let's get to the news. As of today, the United States has hit the debt limit, which means that the federal government cannot borrow any more money to pay the bills we've already racked up until Congress authorizes it to do so. As it's done in the past, the Treasury Department said it can take, quote, extraordinary measures to keep paying our bills until sometime in June, when the U.S. would be forced to start skipping debt payments, precipitating a global economic crisis unlike any we've seen in our lifetimes. President Biden and Democrats in Congress would like to avoid such a crisis by simply authorizing the Treasury to pay our bills, while Republicans refuse to do so unless they get massive spending cuts that would have to include Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. Happy Thursday, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> they said this day would never come. <laughs> so for people who haven't lived through or paid attention to one of these debt limit standoffs, can you explain why Congress periodically lights a giant fuse under the economy and waits to put it out until the last possible second? Well, John... Just one of begins... many metaphors we're going to use. The great thing about a debt ceiling crisis is there's just, just a whole bunch of metaphors for you to use. There's hostage taking. There's lighting a fuse. There's, there's you know, holding a gun to the economy. Just endless metaphors to use. All of them very cliche. Uh, the ceiling itself is a metaphor, <laughs> if you will. That's right. That's right. It all begins, John, with the founders, <laughs> <laughs> who made a series of ill-informed decisions based on recency bias that were then compounded by 250 years of dysfunction and incompetence from Republicans that have brought us to this moment now, where the entire global economy depends on Marjorie Taylor Greene, Paul Gosar, and Lauren, Lauren Boebert. USA. USA. <laughs> I mean, how deep do you want to go here? Do you want to? Should we explain what the debt ceiling is? How we got like what like what it means? Is that the yeah? Right let's way? go. Let's go. Uh, sixty second Vox explainer route. I have never done anything in sixty seconds, <laughs> so we're, <laughs> we'll see. Short version: The United States runs into deficit. We spend more money than we bring in. That has been true all but four years since nineteen seventy, and therefore, in order to pay our bills, we have to borrow money. In the beginning of this country. Congress had to approve every time the U.S. Treasury borrowed money to pay its bills. They found that cumbersome because even back then they didn't like working. So in World War I, they passed a bill that said to, get, to grant the Treasury Secretary authority to borrow money up until a certain number. When they hit that number, they had to come back for more authority. And so we have now hit that number. We have borrowed as much money. It means that now the Treasury you know, cannot borrow any more money without Congress passing a bill. And that has led, over the course of time, to ha Congress having to pass the debt limit. They've passed it many, many times in the past. They passed it as recently as a year and a half ago. And all, it is usually a very pro forma thing that happens, but now it has become imbued with all sorts of drama because our politics are driven by radical MAGA extremists. And the key thing to remember here, if you remember nothing else, is that Congress has already authorized this spending. So it is not, by, rif by lifting the debt ceiling, you are not granting the United States government the authority to spend more money because that money has already been spent. All you're doing is saying, okay, the United States can pay the debts it has already incurred, which is why the whole thing is stupid. Yes, all the money has been spent. Not lifting the debt limit will not reduce spending. It will not reduce the deficit. It will not reduce the debt. In fact, it will make those things worse, which we can talk about in a minute. It is a completely fake, stupid thing. If you want to reduce spending, you negotiate through the budget process because Congress passes a budget once in a while um, that authorizes spending. And so if you don't like how much we're spending, that's where you negotiate. 
in in the in the budget process that happens once a year that could possibly lead to a government shutdown, which is also stupid. But at least that is the area that you negotiate if you want to reduce spending. The debt limit is just saying, oh, there's this artificial thing out there that that Congress has put in place that if we breach it could cause economic catastrophe. And now we're going to use that as leverage to get what we want, is what the Republicans are saying. Uh, And why would breaching the debt limit and defaulting on our debts cause economic chaos? Because I don't think it is obvious. U.S. bonds, what we sell to finance our debt, is the bedrock of the global financial system. It is seen as the most secure, safest investment that anyone can make. Countries buy it, markets buy it, and if if one day the United States was unable to pay the interest on those bonds, then it would cause a mass, it would set off a cataclysmic chain reaction across the world. Bond markets would sink, stock markets would sink, businesses wouldn't know what to invest in, it would likely cause a global recession, a U.S. recession, cause the unemployment rate to go up. And then here at home, we would not, we don't know if we could pay people their social security checks, if Medicare could pay healthcare bills, if veterans would get their benefits checks in the mail, if we would be able to deploy FEMA in the case of a hurricane, anything and everything is on the table. It would undo not just the economic growth we've had since the pandemic, but everything since 2008. And honestly, most economists think it would make certainly the 2008 financial crisis look like a blip and would be something akin, if not worse, to what happened in the Great Depression. So bad. Yeah, it doesn't Very sound, bad. Uh, doesn't sound great. Doesn't sound great. And the key thing here to understand is that global financial stability depends on faith that the U.S. will pay its bills um, since we are the global reserve currency and U.S. Treasury debt is, is, mm. is the safest investment in the world. And when that faith is eroded, the whole thing collapses. So, for example, the last time we went through the most serious time in our lifetime that we went through one of these crises, debt ceiling crisis, you and I were in the White House. This was 2011. And because Congress got very, very close to not lifting the debt ceiling in time, didn't breach the debt ceiling, but it got really close, the stock market plunged and did not recover for half a year. Interest rates and mortgage rates rose. Consumer confidence plunged. We lost our credit rating. And so there was a whole bunch of economic damage, higher costs for folks, um, bigger deficits that the government had to run (laughs) as a cost of all of this. And so there was all of this economic pain, and that wasn't even breaching the debt limit. So it it is, in a sense, about our ability to pay our bills, but it's also about the world's belief that we will pay our bills and that we have a functioning government that can pay the debt that we incur. And if that belief, if people don't really believe that, then chaos could ensue. So that's why even getting close to it is a fucking problem. But John, didn't you just say that we hit it today? Uh, yes. So we hit it today. We hit it today. And then... And then uh, Janet Yellen came out, the Treasury Secretary, and she said, well, the Treasury can take extraordinary measures to, um, to keep us from defaulting on the debt. Uh, so what are extraordinary measures, Dan? <laughs> I was hoping you were going to explain that because that's what it's Well, I can. I mean, they've become... They're, yeah, go they're for it. Go ex- for it. Well, they're called extraordinary measures, but they've become quite ordinary because now every time there's a debt ceiling crisis, um, a Treasury Secretary comes out and takes extraordinary measures. Basically, it's just shifting money around in a bunch of different accounts <laughs> in the government to, um, it has- to to make sure that they pay. And they like they take investments out. They, there are certain investments the government makes that they sort of take out so they can do... There's like It's like accounting tricks, basically, uh, that they can do for the next several several months to sort of avoid hitting the real debt limit. In the 1980s, when we had a very, very brief debt limit fight, the Reagan's Treasury Circuit took money out of the Social Security Trust Fund, which was then, which was actually illegal. And so since then, Congress passed a law which gave the Treasury Secretary a list of legal things they could do. And it really involves playing around with investments and pension funds that you then make whole on the back end. Yeah. So it's like it doesn't. None of no one in the immediate term is going to feel any impact from that. So in that sense, it's sort of an accounting trick. But you are going to have to at the end 
pay for what you did. It, co- it costs the U.S. money to do this over the long term, which is another reason why it's so stupid that we are in this place. Yeah, for all these people who are doing this so they could lower the deficit, this will only increase our deficits, just the, the brinkmanship itself. And um, you were talking about how the Treasury can move the money around. So usually the um, the Treasury Department has six to $700 billion on its balance sheet that it can use to pay our bills. Even back in 2021, when we got close to the debt limit, there were days when they had almost a zero. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how that's how uh, shaky it can get here. Um, Goldman Sachs says that uh, that even if we get close to this and there's brinkmanship and we get close to the debt limit, it could kill the equivalent of one tenth of America's economic activity. Uh, estimates from the centrist think uh, think tank, the Third Way, think estimates from Third Way, which is a centrist think tank, says that it could cost three million jobs, add one hundred and thirty thousand dollars to the cost of a typical thirty-year mortgage, and increase the debt by eight hundred and fifty billion dollars. So, good job, good job uh, controlling the debt. So, Republicans haven't agreed exactly. Republicans haven't agreed on exactly what kind of budget cuts they want, <laughs> um, but everyone from the MAGA freaks to the uh, Republicans sitting in Biden districts have said they refuse to lift the debt ceiling um, on its own with just a clean debt ceiling raise. So they're not going to they don't want to do that. The White House and Democrats in Congress say they'll only negotiate potential cuts after the debt ceiling is raised because they do want to don't want to negotiate around the debt ceiling. Why is that their position? And do you think it's tenable? It's important to understand that prior to 2011, the debt limit was always for show. There was sort of an unwritten agreement between that the party out of power would not vote for the debt limit, but they would make sure it passed if, they, if enough votes were needed. And so we avoided all the economic damage you've talked about, certainly not just, not just breaching the debt limit, but coming close enough that it does damage the economy. That changed in 2011 when Repu- the Tea Party Republicans came in, they de- they realized that their economic agenda of these steep, steep spending cuts in things like education and health care, repealing the ACA, cutting Social Security and Medicare, were so unpopular, they could not enact them through the normal course of business. They couldn't win political power on that agenda. They couldn't have the House, the Senate, and the White House to do it. So they decided to shortcut it, which was to take the debt limit and say, if you don't give us our unpopular agenda, then we're going to blow up the economy. And they forced President Obama to the table where he didn't do 99% of what they wanted, but there was some spending cuts. Some of them certainly were not great. And after that, the president said, I am never doing that again. I cannot let these people take the U.S. economy hostage who try to put in place this Republican extremist agenda that the country does not want and had rejected in election after election after election. So in 2013, the next time a debt ceiling battle came, he said, I'm not going to, we're not going not to negotiate over it. You're going to pass a clean debt ceiling. That's on you. That's your job. You're in charge of the house. If you have a meeting, I'm not going. If you send a, an offer, I'm sending it back. And he stared them down and he won. And that has been the democratic position since then, because if you give in a little, these folks are going to try to use it for everything. First, it's spending cuts and it's Medicare cuts and it's you know, national abortion ban, then it's banning books. All the things Republicans want to do, they can't do normally. They'll use the debt ceiling to do. And so that's why it's so important to stand strong in this place. You don't pay ransom to hostage takers or they'll be incentivized to take more hostages. Um, the, the challenge is two questions. Well, you know what that is? Another metaphor. metaphor. <laughs> what happens if they're willing to shoot the hostage, even knowing that they may get hurt in the process, which again, Marjorie Taylor Greene, <laughs> Paul Gosar, this is the house that we've got. And then the other thing that the Democrats will have to deal with and the White House will have to deal with is what happens if Joe Manchin is willing to pay the ransom? What happens if some if the problem solvers caucus uh, is willing to pay the ransom? And by that, meaning at least negotiate around some cuts. And that that, I think, is what's going to um, uh, that's going to be the real challenge for the White House and a lot of Democrats in the coming months. Um, that's exactly right. House Republicans reportedly uh, plan to vote on a bill that would tell the Treasury Department what to do if the debt limit is breached. Very helpful. According to The Washington Post, uh, the plan is almost certain to call on Treasury to keep making interest payments on the debt and may stipulate that the Treasury Department should continue making payments on Social Security, Medicare and veterans benefits, as well as funding the military. Could this work? Who wouldn't get paid in this scenario? Seems unlikely to work. And I know that because it's a Republican economic plan. (laughs) There's no precedent for this. We do not know. But to be very clear, what they are saying is 
whatever money the federal government has, because it's important to understand that the federal in the during in the, even in this period of extraordinary measures, money still comes into the federal government. People are still paying taxes, right? Other there are other programs that provide revenue to the government. Is the Republicans are saying take that money, every dollar you get, and your first priority when you get that dollar is to pay off foreign governments that hold U.S. debt, most prominently the Chinese. So we're going to pay the Chinese first. Then whatever money we have left, we might sprinkle it around the American people. And it seems unlikely that there's enough money to do that and pay Social Security and pay Medicare and pay the military. And so it runs into some real substantive accounting challenges, let alone the fact that it may probably is not legal in any way, shape or form. Also, back to my point about it, this depends on faith in the ability of the U.S. to pay its debts. If the world realizes that the U.S. is Yes, paying interest on their debt still, but by the way, isn't cutting Social Security checks or paying the military. Or, like that's going to cause everything to unravel as well. Even if they are, yeah, people aren't going to buy our bonds. On no one's going right. to buy the bonds because everyone's going to know that that's next. Um, all right. So, what are some possible solutions here that don't involve hiding all of our money under mattresses? Option one: Republicans do their fucking job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it. Pass the bill, and that can happen in two ways. One, Kevin McCarthy just puts a bill on the floor, and he doesn't have to vote for it, doesn't have to lobby for it. 95% of Republicans don't have to vote for it. You just have to put the bill on the floor, take all the Democrats plus a small handful of Republicans, and you're there. Kevin McCarthy is unwilling to do that, and he may be unwilling to do it because he essentially promised the Freedom Caucus he would not do that in exchange for speaker for the speakership, is there could be a discharge position. And a discharge petition is when 218 members of Congress sign a petition saying, bring this bill to the floor. And if you get that number of signatures, then a bill can go to the floor directly. It doesn't have to go through the Freedom Caucus stacked uh, rules committee or the Freedom Caucus adjacent House leadership. It can just go right to the floor. You get a vote. You get 100% of Democrats, 5% of Republicans. You're done. That takes time and it requires a specific bill. We don't have we don't have a lot of time. We don't have a specific bill yet. So that's a problem. So you would need to file the discharge petition basically now. Um, because it's supposed to sit in committee for a certain number of days, legislative days, before it comes up for the vote. And if you did it now, that would get us to mid-May. And Janet Yellen said we have basically until mid-June. So right now, you'd need to find 218 people in the House of Representatives um, to sign on to the discharge position. You'd get all the Democrats, but you'd still need four or five Republicans. And even so-called moderate Republicans like Don Bacon of Nebraska are saying they're not willing to sign on to a clean debt limit hike right now. By the way, you'd also need 60 votes in the Senate for that, which we don't have right now. Among We don't have 10 Republicans right now for the clean hike. So um, the clock is really ticking on the discharge petition option, at least as of right now. Yep. Other options include, and these are, I would say, much more challenging options. One option would be minting the trillion dollar coin. And so let me explain that for a second. The because you're going to hear a lot about is, the. I got a I, I got a text from my brother about this uh, over the weekend. He said, "I've been looking at this debt limit thing, and I've been going really deep on this." He's like, "What about the coin? Sounds like the coin is <laughs> an okay idea." I, fe- I felt like I was back in 2011. Yeah. Yes. So the at one point in time, Congress granted the U.S. Treasury Secretary the sole authority to mint platinum coins of any denomination. Now. I haven't dug into legislative history here, but I'm pretty positive this was a bill pushed by lobbyists for the platinum industry to get more like platinum silver dollars in circulation. But because of that very broadly written bill, theoretically, the Treasury, Janet Yellen could mint one coin, assign it $1 trillion in value, deposit it in the bank, and pay all of our bills. Now, that would solve the immediate threat of default. It would have some real downstream economic issues <laughs> that we would have to deal with. And no one really, and obviously, this would have to go through the courts. The other sort of extreme option here is the president can simply direct the Treasury Secretary to just pay the bills regardless of the debt limit. And there are arguments. A lot of lawyers believe that the debt limit is unconstitutional. It violates the 14th Amendment, which speaks to the sanctity of U.S. debt payments and debt obligations. Others believe that it is in great conflict with the Social Security Act and other laws that deal with entitlement programs where we owe these people, we have to pay these people. That then, of course, would go to this very fair-minded 
Supreme Court we have <laughs> that would have to make a decision. And that just doing those things that are on fragile footing, I would say, would have would rattle the markets in tremendous ways because they wouldn't know how to react because one day we're paying our debt limits and then you're one Trump appointed judge in Texas away from default. And I think that would have also cause a lot, I would say it's a fair amount of uncertainty. Yeah. Again, it goes back to the question, um, would you buy a U.S. Treasury bond if um, uh, Joe Biden's in court uh, trying to figure out if he could just, uh, you know, use the 14th Amendment to uh, lift the debt, sim- the debt limit? <laughs> I wouldn't. I don't think I'd buy one. <laughs> you think the full faith and credit of the United States being uh, up to Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar is alarming? Think about it when it becomes the uh, pillow talk between Ginny and Clarence Thomas. Like, it's just... <laughs> We haven't done much better there either. Uh, any other options? I have one more. The way this ends. Uh, let me l- let me hear yours. Well, uh, you know uh, the uh, uh, Davos's biggest celebrity, Joe Manchin, has been uh, has been given interviews from Davos, which is you know where a West Virginia conservative goes to hang out and be of the people. Uh, I think I believe he was talking to Maria Bartiromo. Uh, again, the typical interview you do when you're at Davos uh, with the people. And he's starting to say, like, yeah, I, I do think we should consider, you know, at least he goes, we should obviously lift the debt ceiling. We shouldn't play around with the full faith and credit of the United States. But we should at least use this moment to recognize that our debt is out of control and form some kind of committee. So you can see see some kind of committee uh, solution come out of this and i've heard a few people talk about the trust act which is like bipartisan legislation in the senate which basically says that you form a rescue committee for each trust fund in the united states the social security trust fund the medicare trust fund and then you basically have the committees come up with solutions for to make those funds solvent and then all it basically does is it's like fast tracks the legislation to the floor so that it can get a vote but nothing else it doesn't require anything it doesn't instill any kind of automatic cuts. It's basically just a committee. Now, if that gets like Joe Manchin and Mitt Romney, who's a sponsor of this bill and people like that on board, that's great. But I wonder if in the House that doesn't run into the same problems for Kevin McCarthy that a clean hike uh, would run into, because I don't think that's going to satisfy Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar and the Freedom Caucus. But I could see that being I could see that being uh, one end game here. There is a history here, which is in 2010, when the Democrats had a bunch of Senate votes and were, uh, sorry, in 2010, when the Democrats had 59 senators and were in the process of freaking out about the upcoming 2010 elections, they the, de- the Senate Democrats tried to hold President Obama hostage over the debt limit and demanded the creation of the Simpson-Bowles Commission. That commission met. It, it filled hours of time on Morning Joe, but obviously came to no conclusion and uh, forced no spending plan. Then in 2011, the Republicans specifically rejected a commission in, in with no teeth for one that had to have teeth. And so the whole, the whole all the spending cut deal that, around 2011 that we deeply regret came at the end of a bipartisan commission that could come up with no plan because Republicans and Democrats obviously can't agree on these things because they want to cut Social Security. We don't. Then, then these forced mandatory cuts went into place. So that I think that would be the blockage here is that they've been down the pure commission path and it hasn't gotten what they want. So that'd make it harder for McCarthy. Let me ask you something. Uh, back in 2010, when the Simpson Bowles Commission was created, um, what if someone were to tell you that over a decade later you'd be talking about Simpson Bowles with me on a podcast? <laughs> I would have put the odds of that at exponentially higher than the Simpson Bowles Commission accomplishing its goals. <laughs> I didn't even know what a podcast was at that time, and I a would have been a real throwback. The Simpson yeah. Bowles Commission. Uh, anyway, I think everything will be fine. Uh, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe put the money under your mattress. I don't know. I don't. I think it's uh, look. I, it was it was scary being in the White House dealing with this in 2011. And that was with the Tea Party, which today looks um, much saner than the Republicans who currently control the House. So that's all I'll say about that. It is uh, it is something to definitely be concerned about. Um, of all the stories we talk about on this podcast, I do think breaching the debt limit, while it sounds boring and in the weeds, is something that we should be alarmed about. Um, yeah. In 2013, it almost killed me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
You li- this yeah. literally Go- gave you a stroke. I mean, not literally, but close yeah. enough. <laughs> close enough. Close enough. Yeah. Um, lest anyone think that cooler Republican heads may prevail on this, look no further than the committee assignments Kevin McCarthy handed out to some of the most batshit MAGA House members. Jim Jordan will chair the Judiciary Committee. Anti-vax election denier Mark Green will chair Homeland Security. And the House Oversight Committee, which handles most investigations, will include Marjorie Taylor Greene, Paul Gosar, Lauren Boebert, Lauren Boebert, and coup plotter Scott Perry. Uh, the White House had something to say about this. Here's Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre at her briefing yesterday. On some of these key committees, it appears that House Republicans have handed over the keys to the most extreme MAGA members of the Republican caucus. This is what we're seeing uh, from the other side of Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. These are members who have promoted violent rhetoric and dangerous conspiracy theories. And so Republican leaders should explain, they should have to explain, not us, they should have to explain why allowing these individuals to serve on these committees and come clean with the American people about the, the secret agreements, the secret deals that were made with these extreme MAGA uh, MAGA extremists in that are currently uh, in in the House. So unusual for the White House to comment on House committee assignments. Why do you think they did? Because it's unusual to appoint a bunch of media grifting knuckleheads to be in charge of important legislative committees. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it might be uh, politically beneficial for the White House? <laughs> I mean, the, in a situation where a Republican, where any House ha- that has no ability or in this case, even interest in enacting laws, the way they get attention, the way they the country comes to know them is through committee hearings, and particularly investigative committee hearings. So if you put a bunch of people who are avatars for the exact Republicans who got their ass, asses kicked in 2022, you're giving a gift to the White House. So every time, you know, it's like the documents, right? We're going to talk about the documents in a second. The Republicans going to hold all these oversight hearings on it. The press will cover the shit out of these oversight hearings because they want to be, one, they desperately need cable ratings like never before. And they want to be balanced because they give so much coverage to the January 6 hearings. And when people, Americans turn on the TV, they're going to see Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert and Paul Gosar saying insane stuff. It just gives the White House an amazing opportunity to dismiss what the Republicans are doing as being a clown show. You put clowns on the dais, it's going to look like a circus. You don't think they'll comport themselves well? You know, look, I don't want to be dismissive of the chance they'll do what they'll comport themselves well and take their jobs very seriously, but it seems unlikely to me. Like, you know, maybe if she doesn't mention Jewish space lasers, maybe that's a win for Marjorie Taylor. Maybe, maybe if they, that's a win they for don't the invite Nick Fuentes to sit in the front row. Yeah, exactly. No white nationalists at the hearing. That's a win. Um, yeah, no, I, I think the White House is pretty excited about this Politico reported that they were texting each other digital high fives uh, <laughs> over this, which made me, what's a digital high five? Is that like, is that like an open hand emoji? Do you think? I, I don't know. I mean, just high five each other. <laughs> yeah, they're sitting right next I mean, to they each work, other. Yeah, they're in an office, right? <laughs> digital high fives. Um, okay. So one of the issues uh, these yahoos in the house have promised to investigate is how classified documents from the Obama administration ended up in President Biden's home and office. Around 20 documents uh, have now reportedly been recovered so far. Some mark top secret, at least one marked the highest classification level, TSSCI, which stands for Top Secret Sensitive Compartmented Information. Uh, and since we've got nothing to do but wait for the new special counsel to complete his investigation, the media is filling time by speculating about the political fallout with some help from all the usual suspects leading to headlines like this one from NBC News. Democratic allies grow frustrated with White House response to Biden's classified documents. Love when Democratic allies unburden themselves to reporters. You know, it's just my my favorite thing, my favorite thing that happens. Um, Dan, what could the White House have done differently? And uh, what should they be doing now? Develop time travel. Yeah. Gone back yeah. to twenty seven, early 2017 and not put the documents in the office in the garage. It's about and it. I said, like, obviously we're kidding here, but I'm trying to make the point that that 99% of the legal challenges and political problems they have are from that mistake. The, what has been said and done since then has compounded some of it, but ultimately that that's the problem. Once you have 
put a classified document in the wrong place at the exact same time that the former president of the United States is involved in his own classified and your most likely rival for the presidency is in his own classified document investigation being investigated by a special counsel appointed by your attorney general, you were almost certainly going to end up right here, which is in the middle of a controversy that the press and the Republicans can use false equivalents to amp up and have your own special counsel investigation. Almost nothing in between then and now would have averted that outcome, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think the the main criticism that I've seen is they started off by telling us there were documents in the office. Um, why didn't they tell us then that there were also documents in the residence, that there were other, you know, why didn't why did this information continue to dribble out over the course of a week or so? And the Washington Post had some great had a great story on this, very deeply reported. And it does seem like so the the lawyer finds the first set of documents, does what they're supposed to do, and immediately notifies the Biden officials. The Biden officials immediately notify the Department of Justice, again, which you're supposed to do. And the Department of Justice says to the Biden lawyers, all right, you guys chill out. We are now running this investigation because it's the Department of Justice and that's what's proper to do. And once the Department of Justice started running the investigation, the Biden people said, thought to themselves, we can't really speak publicly about this because we don't want to interfere or be seen as influencing in any way the independent DOJ's investigation. And so we are not going to say anything about this until DOJ completes the investigation and says something on their own. Now, what DOJ then decided was, we're going to now appoint a special counsel <laughs> um, on all of this and that we're going to, you know, go at our own pace. So you can imagine, I know because you were the White House communications director, uh, a situation where a lot of the comms people in the White House were sitting there saying, like, why can't we give more information out to the press? Why can't we be transparent about this? And the lawyers are saying we don't want to get crossways with the uh ongoing investigation that's being conducted by the Justice Department, which is supposed to be independent, which we're not supposed to be influencing in any way. Essentially, as a legal and political strategy, the White House made a bet that if they cooperated as fully as they could, were the opposite of what Trump was, did everything right, showed the Department of Justice they wanted to get to the bottom of this, because I believe they legitimately did, Yeah, that they this would not come to light before the Justice Department had decided there was nothing to investigate and no crime had been committed. So you would have it one day, they would say, Biden had these documents, we've looked at it, it's fine. And they would avoid a special counsel because a special counsel comes with a lot of downstream impacts of other things they can investigate in, sort of restarts the clock at zero again for much of the work was already done. Then there's a new person in charge. That was their bet. That bet did not pay off. I understand why they made that bet. And if, to the extent there was a mistake from a public relations perspective, and this is a case, as you said, of legal approach trumping politics and messaging, is when CBS News got the story about that doc, that one document at the Biden Penn Center, they responded to that. And the decision, according to this Washington Post story, which was, I think, very well done and very helpful in understanding all of this, was we're only going to react to what is public. We're not going to potentially anger the Department of Justice by putting out information they have not put out. Yeah. So they put out a statement that what did not fully disclose all the information. Then they had to, they made did the same thing again when we found out about the garage document. And then had to then react when that next document came out. And that is always in the crisis communications 101 is tell the story on your terms and tell it all at once. And so now you're in the sort of drip 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 which has eroded some credibility with the press, which is looking for a reason to go after Biden. I understand why they made that decision. We can't go back in time and fix it, but that is sort of where they are. You can tell they've already changed approach some because Bob Bauer, who is the president's personal attorney, who you and I know very well, we work with for years, is the best in the business, held a conference call with reporters on Saturday, I believe it was, to help explain the whole chain of custody, the events, the approach. And then this Washington Post story was clearly informed by people who were trying to get yeah. the full story out. Although you see, the last line of the Washington Post story um, <laughs> notes that the the uh, Biden office where they originally found the first document has remains uncleared. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> so they, they, they haven't finished checking that one? Like, thanks. I mean, if it, I'm sure that the, uh, there are no small number. Of, I'm sure that 
from President Biden to his political team to his communications team, they are quite annoyed with the uh, the pace and style of the Justice Department <laughs> investigation into this. Because yes. I'm sure they would like nothing more than for them to check all of the places that the classified documents could be as fast as possible and finish this investigation as fast as possible. Like, no one likes this dragging out. You know, they're, they're, not, they're not cheering this on. <laughs> No, no, no. I would imagine they are not. <laughs> so it sucks. I thought that Matt Miller, who we both know, who has worked at the White House and the Justice Department, had a, had a good quote in that Washington Post story. He said, oftentimes when you're doing something that from the outside doesn't appear to make sense, it's not because you don't know what you're doing. It's because you face some choices people don't understand. Or, and I would add that sometimes people aren't allowed to understand because you're not allowed to talk about them, which puts you in a shitty political position. But, you know. You have to be like, all right, well, we're following guidelines, we're following the law, and that's what we're doing. Every person who talks about, writes about, tweets about the White House should print, write that quote down and put it on the mirror because that explains so much of all these situations. You're like, these people are very smart. We know them. Why did they do this? That's the answer is they're doing it for, they're making this decision because there's a whole bunch of other competing equities that we do not know about, cannot know about, could be. In this case, a legal situation, it can often is national security situations, legislative situations. That's a perfect, well done, Matt. That's a perfect explanation of what working in the White House is like and why people like us who talk about it have to be very open minded about why it's more complicated than we think. Fun times, fun times. Uh, okay. What a, great, what, a, what a great A block. What a great A block. All right. When we come back, I will talk to Sarah Longwell from The Bulwark about what's on voters' minds. Today's presenting sponsor is Simply Safe Home Security. 2023 will hopefully be a quieter year between election cycles. The calm before the 2024 storm. Well, there's the Republican primary. What do you think is going to happen? Oh, so fine. while we all catch our breaths, now is a great time to protect your home with Simply Safe Home Security. At Simply Safe, your safety is the only thing that matters. Here's why Love It enjoys it so much. Two points. One, I feel like when we all catch our breath, we just catch one breath together. You don't mm. catch breaths. It's like a collective breath. Okay. That's you know? important. Sure. Also, I set up a Simply Safe system and I'm really happy with it. Works really well. You set it up yourself and then it's, it looks good. The app is excellent, completely reliable, never once had a problem, was always available, always worked. Highly recommend. Simply Safe protects every inch of your home from intruders, fires, flooding, and more. It's monitored by live professional monitoring agents ready to dispatch emergency assistance to your home when you need it most. In an emergency, agents use fast protect technology only from Simply Safe to capture critical evidence and verify the threat is real so you can get priority police dispatch. Professional monitoring costs under a dollar a day with no long term contract, less than half the price of traditional home security systems. With the Simply Safe app, you can lock and unlock your doors, access your cameras and arm and disarm your system from anywhere, anytime. CNET named Simply Safe Editor's Choice. Customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash crooked. Go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off your order with interactive monitoring. That's simplysafe.com slash crooked. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Pod Save America is brought to you by Manukura. Did you know that the best tasting honey on the planet comes from New Zealand, Tommy? Uh, everybody knows that. It's well known. It's well known? It's one uh, of the things that everyone seems to know. I did not know that. In the remote and magical forests of this small island, bees feed on the highly active nectar of the Manukora tea tree. Cool. And make a super honey that's unlike anything you've ever seen or tasted before. Manukora has absolutely mastered the creamy texture of this honey through their ethical beekeeping practices that keep it 100% raw. It's a super honey because super of its honey. unique it's antioxidants and prebiotics, as well as a natural antibacterial compound called MGO that only comes from the nectar of this tea tree. It contains nutrients that support optimal immune and digestive health. Tommy, did you? Well, how did you try it? Straight it, from the spoon, okay, baby. Okay, raw, 100% raw. You, it's delicious you. all on its own. You don't need it on pancakes, yogurt, salad. I've dressing. been doing something embarrassing. You want to know what it is? I'll tell yep. you. I've been making myself like cheese plate for dessert you know because i don't want to have dessert you're french now but it's not like a cheese plate like at a fancy place it's just slices of cheddar cheese from the from the deli cheese bag and, and then i put in honey i put mixed nuts from the the old nut container from a sponsor that's no longer a sponsor those nuts are ancient <laughs> and then i put a squeeze of man manukora this honey <laughs> i gotta say uh it does taste really good a little honey tastes really good with cheese or with uh peanut i put butter. it in greek yogurt too somehow i haven't come across this yet and now i will have to 
and I'm really excited about it because Great. just listening to you two, it's hopefully good, it's work. It's got to be working on the listener because I'm I'm leaving this ad session and getting this. Hey, yeah, love it. I can't tell if he's being sarcastic or if he's. I don't no, know. no, no. I'm, he's I'm being really serious. It's I'm just, just wondering how the two really of you, how the two of you got access to this, and we not got, me. There were three boxes. You got your. I got a guy. We got we got honey. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Manukora's Super Honey is available in a range of easy-to-use formats, including squeeze bottles and compostable honey stick packs, so you can eat it straight or add to your favorite food or beverage. If you head to manukora.com slash crooked, you'll automatically get a free pack of honey sticks with your order, a $15 value. That's manukora, M-A-N-U-K-O-R-A dot com slash crooked. A lot of buzz about this, honey. Going to give you that spelling again, M-A-N-U-K-O-R-A dot com slash crooked. To get a free pack of honey sticks with your order, it's called Honey with Superpowers for good reason. <laughs> so get on it and try this delicious creamy caramel honey, and you won't look back with Manukura. Pod Save America is brought to you by Tommy John. Is it weird to give underwear on Valentine's Day? I mean, no. Is it weird to give bad underwear on Valentine's Day? Yeah. Yeah, that seems, that seems like it's bad. Pamper your partner's posterior with Tommy John. I mean, it's Oof. definitely not weird to give... Like, hey, Tommy John, I think it's weirder when you have us do it on Father's Day. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. Talk but about Valentine's that. Day Talk makes about sense. that more. When you and your favorite person are wearing Tommy John, you're that much more comfortable so you can do everything better. From Tommy John's incredibly soft, breathable underwear to playful Valentine's Day pajamas and limited editions, 98% of men and women love Valentine's Day gifts from Tommy John. Thanks to dozens of comfort innovations like soft tri-blend and micromodal fabrics with four-way stretch, Tommy John helps you feel the love all year long. That's why Tommy John doesn't have just have customers. They got fanatics. And with over 20 million pairs sold, it's easy to see why. We love Tommy John. We wear Tommy John. We talked about it forever. And, uh, you know, you should try it for yourself and maybe try it for your Valentine. Plus, there's no risk because every gift is backed by Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear or it's free guarantee. Get 20% off your first purchase at TommyJohn.com slash Cricket right now for Valentine's Day. Hurry to TommyJohn.com slash Cricket for 20% off. TommyJohn.com slash Cricket. See site for details. Pod Save America is brought to you by Noom. Do you eat because you're bored? Absolutely. Most or can't pass up food when it's free? Yep, that's also me. Go if fair. so, don't stress. Noom weight can help you break the cycle and change your habits for good. They say losing weight starts with your brain. So Noom Weight uses psychology to help you understand your eating habits and learn how to make healthier choices every day. Scientific principles like cognitive behavioral therapy help you understand your relationship with food, and you don't have to give up carbs or anything. To date, Noom Weight has helped more than 4.6 million people lose weight. Choose your level of support from five-minute daily check-ins to personal coaching. Active first-time Noomers lose an average of 15 pounds in 16 weeks. Wow. Yeah. That's that's why we love Noom here, because uh, it's not too strict. It just sort of helps guide you to make better choices. You got to make better choices. <laughs> We're all making choices every day. And, uh, you know, sometimes you're saying, oh, I'll eat Cheesecake Factory for the second time in a week. But the point is Noom can help, and you should sign up for Noom. Okay, glad we, glad we keyed you in on this. Stay focused on what's important to you with Noom Weight Psychology-Based Approach. Sign up for your trial today at noom.com slash crooked. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash crooked to sign up for your trial today. And check out Noom's first ever book, The New Mindset, a deep dive into the psychology of behavior change, available to buy now wherever books are sold. Joining us today is publisher of The Bulwark, founder of the Republican Accountability Project, host of the excellent Focus Group podcast, Never Trump Extraordinaire, Sarah Longwell. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here in person. Um, you were kind enough to help analyze one of our wilderness focus groups this season. Uh, you conducted countless focus groups yourself in the run-up to the midterms. Did anything surprise you about the results? Uh, I mean, yeah, the results were still better than I expected um, in terms of every swing state election denier going down with the exception of, I guess, Ron Johnson. Yeah. Um, and so but I, I will say, and you may recall this from our conversation, one of the things that I was saying over and over and over again about the swing voters was, look, a lot of the the people who voted for Biden, voted against Trump, who are but had voted for for Trump the first time, they are sort of center right in their orientation. They wanted to vote for a Republican, but they didn't want to vote for the Republican that they had in the offing in their state. So, yeah. you know, you'd hear from them, yeah, you know, I'd really like to vote for Republican, but I'm not voting for Blake Masters or I'm not voting for Dr. Oz. 
And so, um, you know, I was certainly and I, I remember arguing on a CNN panel that, about uh, Don Balduck. And I was like, they're not going to go for Balduck. Like, I sort of knew the, that that was out. But I guess I was and we were one of the biggest outside spenders against Carrie Lake. But I was really worried about that race. Like, Me I too. really thought Carrie Lake uh, was going to pull that one out. So I guess um, I was still pleasantly surprised. But I think that I did see in swing voters there was not an appetite for these extreme candidates. Do, do you think the explanation for the all the midterms is as simple as like Republicans nominated too many MAGA freaks or was there anything else at play? Like how much do you think abortion mattered? How much do you think democracy mattered? Sure. Which I know is sort of a hard thing to define, but. Yeah. So the way that I try to because there was after in the aftermath of the elections, there was a lot of reporters who were trying to like pull them apart. Like, was it democracy? Was it abortion? And it was actually it was all of it. Right. So the Venn diagram of somebody who was really extreme on abortion and who was like a big election denier and super MAGA was basically a circle. Yeah. Right. So like they were the same people. And what you would hear from the voters over and over again was just that they were nuts. And they would often say, look, they're cr in the same breath. They would say, well, you know, Blake Masters is crazy. Uh, his position on abortion is crazy. He's an election denier. And he really likes the Unabomber. You know, like it was just like it all <laughs> came together to form this picture of just an extreme candidate that they weren't comfortable voting for. And the Democrats had sort of done, whether it was incumbency in the case of, of Kelly or with some of the nominees who were just either vanilla enough, just like, you know, not 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 so extreme on their own that the swing voters just just the, they, they saw the the MAGA ones as the as the extreme. Um, so Republicans win the House by about two points nationally. Um, what do you think the typical swing voter in a swing district who cast their ballot for a Republican House candidate expects from a GOP House? What do you think Ooh. they thought they were voting for? <laughs> well, in a swing district, because I'll tell you what's interesting is that, right, there are these different sections of the voters, right? There are a there are a bunch of Republicans. Uh, let's call them maybe Trumpers. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a lot of them wanted to tackle inflation, right? They they had economic issues on their minds. They think Biden's a disaster and, yeah. you know, uh, the, the supply chain and COVID, like that's what they cared about. But there is this other, the always Trumpers or even some mix of people where they do want the Hunter Biden investigation. Right, of course. Uh, yeah. And so so the thing is, is <laughs> that's why they signed up. That's right. You know, I was just doing a focus group. Um, it was just I was walking around here in L.A. and I was listening uh, to one of the groups and and it was just two time Trump voters. And the, my, the moderator was asking about the, the House fight over over the speakership and they were saying, Half the group was like, yes, they should be fighting over this. Like, I want them to take a stand. And it's important to understand that for like the crazy side, the, I don't even want to say that there's a crazy side and a not crazy side. But for the craziest side, there is a base of voters who wants that chaos um, and who wants the investigations. But the swing voters in a swing district. They cared about the economic issues and yeah. and they cared about a check on Biden to some degree, but not in the like Hunter Biden laptop sense. Do you think the speaker's race antics or McCarthy handing over the keys of, to the House to like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar, do you think that has broken through to voters no. in any real way or is that all just noise at this no, point? No, it's all noise. Uh yeah, I mean, so again, I was listening to this group and like they kind of knew that there was sort of chaos and people, they either interpreted it as like stupid inside the beltway stuff that they didn't care about yeah. or they were glad somebody put up a fight against the rhinos. Um, but, I, you know, I think that when it comes to voters on the inside the beltway stuff, one of the stories I always tell is remember the day that uh, the New York Times had Kevin McCarthy dead to rights when he said that he he lied like they he said he was going he wanted Trump to resign. Oh, yeah. Right. And then and then he came when they said that he came out and lied. He put out a statement and said, I never said that. And then they released the tape on him. Right. And D.C. just like goes up in flames. We're all talking about it. We can't believe it. McCarthy. People are asking me, is McCarthy toast? I had a focus group that night. What do you guys think about what happened with McCarthy? And it's just like blank stares. You know, like nobody's listening. No one cares. Um, so, no, the internecine fights. Uh, now, when it comes to like the debt ceiling fight, though, you know, when it has an impact.
act yeah. and they can't govern. Um, and when things are getting shut down, parks, whatever, then it will matter. But I don't think this stuff is, is yeah, hitting voters. Well, so you said you've conducted some focus groups since the midterms. What's on voters' minds since the midterms? So it's been really fascinating to watch two-time Trump voters start to not break with Trump, mm. but start to look for alternatives to ah. Trump. And the way two-time Trump voters, two-time Trump. So the 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 2016, 2020 folks, they and and it it all comes down to electability. So like these guys are tired of losing. And it's interesting because it, there's like a tacit admission that Donald Trump lost. He lost in 20, you know, and for a lot of them, th I mean, I've done focus groups upon focus groups where always more than half the groups think that the election was stolen, but they're still tired of losing. Like after 22, mm. like the main thing that has changed is they want a winner. And so even during the January 6th committee, I was starting to see more and more people, and there were two things happening at once. One, they were being reminded of how much baggage Donald Trump has, just like how much weight he is to carry for them. And the other was Ron DeSantis was starting to have his boomlet. Mm. And so they were starting to say, you know, I just really think we should look for somebody else, somebody with less baggage. Ron DeSantis is pretty cool. I've been seeing a lot of him. He seems great. Uh, and since the 22, that has like really accelerated. Um, they want somebody who can win. Ron DeSantis is the name that comes up with a bullet every single time without being asked. And people just think that he has, the, they call him Trump not on steroids was my favorite one that somebody said. Um, but it's generally like Trump with a brain, Trump without the baggage, tr you know, somebody like Trump, but who, uh, you know, swing voters might like. And so this question of electability and wanting to win just has started to loom so large for them since 22. How much do you think Ron DeSantis is like a blank canvas for these voters where they're just sort of pinning all their hopes and dreams on a candidate who can win versus like how much do they actually know about DeSantis just because they consume a lot of like right wing media. Yeah, it's it's a it's a little more than blank canvas, but their relationship to him is very shallow. Right. So what they have seen of him is he is on like I see him on YouTube, like yelling at teenagers in masks or like yelling at Disney or like yelling at local reporters. And they think this guy's a fighter yeah. and this guy is like Trump. Um, but, you know, without all the tweeting. And the other thing that's so interesting about DeSantis is the way Florida has become the like mecca of just in the imaginations Paradise. of Republicans. Florida is where all the great things happened. It's where everything stayed open during COVID. It's where wokeism goes to die. It's where the culture wars are being won by their side. Yeah. And so, I, and it's funny, I, you hear people talk about it. And I, I went and looked it up because I was so struck by how many people were talking about him winning it by 20 points. Like it was this, because people do still think of Florida as a swing state, but like right. Jeb Bush I think won it by 11 points and then by 13 points. Like these, yeah. he won those governor, but, but you know, the first Ron DeSantis race was close. And so people have thought about it as a swing state. And so when they see DeSantis just like crushing and dominating, that's what they want to happen nationally right now. But they don't know that much really about Ron DeSantis. Do you think DeSantis runs for sure? I have not thought he runs for sure. So part of it, though, is that we're in this really weird. So Donald Trump announces so early and these guys who are governors, whether if you're Yunkin, uh, if you're DeSantis, you have a legislative session, like a really important one. Yeah. You couldn't even begin to do it until May. And so I guess I'm sort of watching to see if the way that it shapes up is that like then there's people who don't have anything going on right now, like Nikki Haley or Mike Mike Pence. So like, do they like get Mike in? Pompeo? Yeah, right. Do they get in <laughs> early? And is there kind of like a a primary that happens that that kind of kicks off with a group of people, and everyone sees how Trump does, and it shakes out, and the investigations happen, and then they sort of wait for the heavy hitters to come in, and Ron DeSantis gets in. I don't think it's a sure thing that he does. You know, he is young. I just I'm always struck by the fact that. He's a he's a he's like 44 years old. It, it's so weird to me. <laughs> he does not have to run head to head against Donald Trump. And you can hear voters grapple with this in the groups like, I don't know how he'll do what he's with Trump. Or, and, and it's also it's like unclear. Does Trump even debate or treat things like a normal primary? Yeah, it's just such a risk. Um, but I do think the donor community and the the the, the if you're Ron DeSantis, if and I was watching these focus groups. 
you couldn't stop me from running. Like, it's just so many voters are saying, you know who I love? That's what I'm wondering. You know who I love is this guy. Uh, and, like, even if you, I mean, first of all, any politician has to have a huge ego to be sure. a politician. And But even if you're, like, on the lower end of that scale, you hear that many voters talking about you and people in the party start telling you. I mean, like, look, I was with Obama in the Senate when he was like, I'm not going to run in 2008. And then, like, Harry Reid talks to him and a bunch of other senators talk to him and he goes in the book tour and he sees the crowd. And, it, like, it becomes something that's hard to push away. It does. My only question, if you talk to sort of reporters from down in Florida or people who know Ron DeSantis, one thing they'll tell you, though, is that he's very surly and he's mm -hmm. not like a great politician. And so I guess my if I'm him, the question is, how self-aware am I? Do I th do I think I am a good enough politician to step onto the stage and meet now the very high expectations that people right. have put on me? <clears throat> and if you if he thinks, yes, he'll do it. If he's worried, he might wait four more years until Donald Trump's not there. Um, do any other Republican candidates come up in focus groups besides DeSantis and Trump from Republicans? Yeah, they do. Um, you know, it's funny how often it is either women or uh, there are very, very few candidates of color, right? So it's like Tim Scott, Nikki Haley, Christine Nome, And I think it's because all the white old men kind of run together in people's heads. Yeah. And so um, <laughs> there are there are other people um, that get brought up. I'll tell you who they do not want at all is uh, Mike Pence. Yeah. Well. I mean, you should hear. It's so <laughs> funny that Mike, I get so many reporters calling me being like, well, you know, Mike Pence really thinks they're a lane. And I was like, well, I don't, I've met almost no voters who they make an audible groaning noise when you bring I mean, him up. Uh, you know, a segment of them wanted to hang him. <laughs> right. This is what I always say to people. I'm like, if you're Mike Pence, can you go to a Trump rally without security? Right. No, you can't. Therefore, uh, like, I don't know how you're going to get the votes to win a nomination in a Republican primary. That's right. Uh, you know, one of the focus groups. Um, I, so here's one of the things that was interesting is I, I was getting so many people saying they wanted somebody other than Trump to run, yeah. that we basically convened two groups of people where Trump had, for with people who had Trump as very high favorables. Because what we all know about the primary is that it comes down to whatever Trump's plurality is, right? You get a fractured field, this is what we saw happen in, uh, in 16, like, do are there 20 percent of the party? Is it 30 percent of the party right. that are always Trumpers? And so I convened two groups um, of the of the of people who have really high favorability. They're like Trump or die. But when you ask about DeSantis and some of the others, what's clear is that they don't know that much about them at all. Yeah. Right. Like Trump's mm -hmm. like well, he, it's early. So. He's running on name ID. Right. Like their attachment to Trump is similarly shallow in some ways. Um, like I, I sort of call them Trump or die because that's what we were looking for. But even with them, they just they Trump's the only one they've ever seen fight. But if somebody else proves to them that they can fight in that same uh, sort of ridiculous way, they could be interested. Well, then this this is something I've been thinking about. How do you how would you advise a Ron DeSantis or another Republican candidate like that to run against Donald Trump? Because my first instinct was like, you got to throw a punch. Yeah. Right. And especially if Trump throws a punch at you, you got to throw a punch back. But then I thought about like how high his favorability has to be, even among voters who are looking for someone else besides Trump. Yeah. And so I wonder if it's a situation where you really have to tread carefully because if you start throwing punches at Trump, then you're hitting a guy that your potential voters might like. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I, I think that a lot of it is um, – you got to you got to say you love Trump. You got to say we owe so much to Trump. You got to pay homage Greatest to Trump. Greatest president we've That's ever right. had. That's uh, right. Yeah. But the thing about and and this is voters are starting to get a whiff of this. You know, Biden, when people talk about Biden, his age is like the number one thing that people cite about why he shouldn't run again or why Republicans talk about him being senile. Trump's only 4 years younger than he is. Mm. Uh and I think that there is a way to sort of gold watch Donald Trump to be like Old man, you were the best. And, you know, we just we love you so much. But we ah, it's it's time. It's time to hang it up or like, you know, and, and like I think we used to do the five decades of service for John McCain. Yeah. Barack Obama used to say <laughs> as just a way to sort of like that's right, like politely, but not but pretty forcefully talk about his age. Give yeah. him so many awards for all the great ways he's made America great. And yeah. but say and we really need someone who can win. We need a next generation because that and I mean, the electability piece, I just couldn't be sometimes. With groups, you know, you just things are very muddled. Like this just is like as clear a signal as I've heard where people are like, I want someone who can win. I want someone that swing voters don't hate. 
and yeah. they just think Trump. People are too out on him. Do you? I, I noticed the um, in the news today that the Trump is planning now on getting back on Twitter. They're already like workshopping his potential first tweet. I don't know what the whole Truth Social thing is uh, lately, but um, do you think that that him being back on Twitter, back on Facebook, if they let him back on Facebook, do you think that helps or hurts him in a Republican primary? I think it hurts. Well, I think it hurts him in the general. I think it hurts him in the general. Yeah. I, <clears throat> look, one of the things that strikes me about DeSantis, and I, this is why it's hard to tell exactly what how good of a politician he is, but one thing. Because he doesn't weigh in on lots of stuff. Like one of DeSantis is actually, I think, things that I'm starting to notice about him is his strategic silence choices yeah. are awfully good. Donald Trump doesn't do any of that. And uh, he's under all these investigations. Uh, look, I think it depends on how the media reacts to him. We're so deep in Trump now <laughs> that all the things that we used to believe were true, right, where people would kind of set the news cycle by Donald Trump's tweets. Is that still true? Right. I wonder how many people come to a Trump rally as he starts to hold his rallies. Like, are they as big as they used to be? Can he still fill a stadium? I don't know the answer to that. I'm not saying he definitely can't. But look, the bloom is off the road. You can't be new twice. And so uh, I don't know how triumphant this return will be. And also, how, how mad are we getting? Remember, he used to like, do these tweets, like my head would explode all the time. Are we still exploding over Donald Trump or are no. we laughing at Donald Trump now? Yeah. And I also think something happened even in... 2020 at his rallies versus 2016 that a lot of people commented on, which is like 2016, he had a message, right? It was like an anti-establishment populist message, plenty of racism and xenophobia in there, but it was also like this me against the establishment thing. By 2020, he's out there and he's so fucking online that he's mentioning controversies on the stump that no one but like 5% of the people who really closely follow politics and right wing politics understand what he's saying, naming the FBI characters and the I mean, no one knows that shit. And I was like, this guy, he just doesn't have the I, I noticed it in 20. And so I think now four years later, he's way off in the deep end. Yeah. I mean, you always <laughs> had to sort of live in the Trump or I'm sorry, in the Fox News cinematic universe mm. uh, in order to like completely understand uh what's going on but it's not that actually i think that one of the things that also comes through with voters like even if they agree with him ah so yes yeah, something happened with the election and nothing was fair and democrats cheat they are tired of talking about that yeah. like they want to talk about joe biden they want to talk about you know all their all the democrats failed policies and if donald trump continues to hold rallies where he talks about the 2020 election being stolen kellyanne conway had this like sort of silly piece in the new york times recently but there was one line that i thought was 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 good uh and it was like the voters don't want to channel your grievances, Donald Trump. They want you to channel their grievances. Right. And that is correct. Yeah. No, yeah. They're, they're, it, it can't just be about him anymore. And I mean, it's always been about him. Sure. But he has at least been able to fool people into thinking like, yeah, your enemies are my enemies and I'm going to fight them on behalf of you. Yeah, but you just said something, too, that I think uh, about the establishment, which is, you know, watching the 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 triangle of Marjorie Taylor Greene, Kevin McCarthy and Donald Trump as they worked that speakership fight. That is the MAGA establishment right now. Yeah. Everybody kept saying, like, the 20 people were the were the hardcore MAGA caucus. And I was like, no, the 200 are the MAGA establishment. Like so many of the people, the Kevin McCarthy people are the people who voted not to certify the election, who say that the election was stolen. They fell in line with Donald Trump. Uh, I the idea that that was a that was the the chaos caucus versus like some kind of governing wing or moderates was an insane frame. I, I don't call them moderates anymore. I'm, I'm calling them like the House members who are sitting in Biden districts. <laughs> it's well, like yeah, the closest but, I can get. Well, so. there. I mean, there are some moderate people. There are some governing people, but yeah. there's not a wing. No, there's no wing anymore. Yeah. Um, all right, Joe Biden. So can't do anything about his age. He can do very little about the macroeconomic conditions. Um, what do you think he can do and the White House can do over the next two years to maximize his chances of winning in 24? Since it seems like all indications that he's running and doesn't seem like he's going to have a primary challenger. I, mean, I suppose that could change, but it doesn't seem like it. Um, if you were advising him on how to keep the Republican leaning voters he won in 2020 in the fold, what would you tell him? You know, it used to be that Joe Biden, the idea of Joe Biden was was running because he was the only one that could beat Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
I don't think that's true anymore. And I think that just about any Republican who's not named Donald Trump will beat Joe Biden. Um, I am, you know, Tim, our friend Tim Miller has this story about uh, how he knew Jeb was going to lose when there some polling came back. And the number one thing people didn't like about Jeb Bush was that his last name was Bush. <laughs> and Tim knew then because you can't change that your last name is Bush. And like you just said, yeah. Biden can't change how old he is. Uh, and he's that number is only going up. Uh, I mean, it, I um, look, I am. I'm a Joe Biden stan. I think Joe <laughs> Biden saved America. I think that he did. He pulled Democrats together. He got everybody to do this amazing thing where they dropped out and endorsed him. Like he 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 is great. Yeah. Um, and uh, and and then the fact that I'm saying that, if you told me that, you know, eight or nine years ago, I think. But like he was the only person that could beat Trump. And he's another person who deserves all the awards. Mm. And he should also say <laughs> early and soon um, that, you know, He's done his part, and it's time for somebody else to take over, uh, who is not Kamala Harris, in my opinion. Uh, and the Democrats, have, my my big concern is that I mean, because if you ask like what my advice would be, it's like you can't make this like he could say he's running, and six months from now still decide not to run. Yeah. Um, I, I like he could do that. I don't think just because he says he is now automatically means that he definitely is, but he can wait too long. He can wait too long, sure. and then there's nobody else that can. I Step think in. that the White House thinks, and I understand why they do, that there's like a there's a waiting in the wings issue, which is like I I we talked about when we were talking about the wilderness, uh, when we were doing the wilderness focus groups. I remember you saying that like in a lot of focus groups, Democrats didn't have a bent, didn't weren't talking about other candidates on the bench, That's right? right? And I noticed that too. I will say after the midterms, there's a number of candidates totally. who won in purple state Democratic candidates that I think, like, maybe not in 24, but in 28, I look around, I see a lot of great young Democrats. But I do wonder, and I have some of the same fears about Biden, and I have some of the same beliefs about him, too. I think he saved America. I love the man. I think he's, like, very, very kind. I think he's been a good president. But, like, the age thing is a concern. But then I look around and everyone, you know, I talk to people about this, like, well, then who else, who else, who else can do it? And I'm like... In 24? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that SNL skit where, where the, yeah, it was, was, was pretty dead on. Um, I agree, though, about the bench. And I don't know. I, look, I think if Ron DeSantis as a second term governor hmm. uh, can get through his legislative session and then announce. Uh, so can Gretchen Whitmer, as far as I'm concerned. Like, maybe yeah. Josh Shapiro can't. Yeah. Um, and look, uh, I, I don't know the Democrats uh as well as you guys do so you've probably spent time with jared polis and a bunch of these other people but i would say that the the bench has been growing and because of the poor performance in 22 there are just more people uh to look at and you know uh there's mitch landrew still hanging you know some of my yeah. some of my moderate centrists are yeah, still no, kicking I, around that yeah. i think uh could but it would take biden biden would have to do it himself like he would have to make the affirmative choice i don't think like gavin newsom can decide to primary him randomly or something no i don't think that's uh, right. and I, I mean i do think having done some focus groups not nearly as many as you but it was like you ask people do you want joe biden to run again all these were biden voters none of them wanted joe biden to run again i couldn't find one right then you ask them about trump they all can't stand trump even the few trump voters were like i don't want him to run again and then i i made them pick and like, oh so what if it was trump biden again and you do get more people who are like, Biden. Yeah. <laughs> so I think in that matchup, you can get why Biden thinks that he's the one who can beat him. But if it's anyone other than Trump, I, I, I see how it's a challenge. Oh, I mean, <laughs> I just think if you've got some energetic 68-year-old, <laughs> you know, like just anybody under the age of 70, it's going to provide a really stark contrast. Yeah. And it's going to be difficult. Yeah. And I'll be right there fighting for Joe Biden, but it's going to be more of an uphill challenge than if it's Donald Trump, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, Sarah Longwell, thank you so much for uh, joining Pod Save America and uh, come back soon. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Pod Save America is brought to you by Brooklyn. Brooklyn and makes shifting season something to look forward to. Find everything you need for a home refresh with award-winning sheets, comforters, and all the accessories in between. Quality always counts when it comes to R&R, &R, so Brooklyn and only trust the best materials to help you unwind. Count on the best weaves and construction for favorites you can keep coming back to. Now's the time to invest in your space because the comforter sale is here. Brooklyn and has sleep down to a science and thought of all the details to help you find your match. Their comforters come in three weights. You get your lightweight, your all-season, and your ultra-warm to make sure you get exactly what you need at bedtime. 
Brooklyn and also offers a down alternative comforter that feels like down while being a hypoallergenic and eco-conscious option. Something we're all looking for. The fill is made from recycled materials and still sleeps like a dream. If you're looking to stock up on essentials for your space, Brooklinen's bundles are the way to go. You can buy more for bed, bath, or both and save more money doing it. Pick the colors, plushness, and every detail your heart desires and get a discount at the same time. And for a limited time, Brooklinen is offering 15% off comforters. Listening after the sale, visit brooklinen.com today and use code CROOKED for $20 off free shipping. That's brooklinen, B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N dot com slash crooked. Pod Save America is brought to you by Policy Genius. Talk about, in your own words, why it's important to get life insurance. Because uh, you might die, and then your family will be left with nothing. I t- you got to take that might out of that sentence. <laughs> if you, you can know? hear this, there's still time. You got people you care about. You got people you want to take care of. No matter what happens, take action now. Since life insurance typically gets more expensive as we age, now's the time to buy. Policy Genius gives you a smarter way to find and buy the right coverage. Policy- you don't know how much time is left in your hourglass. None of us do. <laughs> Ooh, heavy. Policy Genius was built to modernize the life insurance industry. With their technology, you can easily compare life insurance quotes from top companies like AIG and Prudential in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $17 per month for $500,000 of coverage. Policy Genius's licensed agents can help you find options that offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. They're not incentivized to recommend one insurer over another, so you can trust their guidance. There are no added fees, and your personal info is private. No wonder they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net. You deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. Head to policygenius.com or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. When you're at your best, you can do great things, but sometimes life gets you bogged down and you may feel overwhelmed or like you're not showing up the way you want to. Working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of you. And when you feel empowered, you're more prepared to take on everything life throws at you. Talk about a time when you were not feeling your best and how it affected various aspects of your life. No. <laughs> That's why you need saving to it for Saving that for therapy. There you go. Which I am in, which everyone should be in, That's including thing, you, but, dear listener. That's the thing about therapy. It's more effective uh, in helping your mental health than an ad read because <laughs> you get to talk to someone confidentially on your own time about all the challenges that you don't want to disclose to everyone, but you need to talk to someone about. Yeah. Highly recommend. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online, just like us. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Talk about the benefits of therapy in your own words. We did. We love it. We're therapy boys. We've said this many times now. Therapy boys. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash PSA today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash PSA. All right. Before we go, um, you may have heard that uh, Democrats and Joe Biden are coming for your gas stoves. um, And we have decided to explore uh, whether this is true. In a new segment we're calling, I'm about to myth bust. Um... (laughs) Named by our fearless producer, Olivia Martinez, who is here to take us through this game. Hello. Thank you for having me. And thank you for being okay with calling it that. John and Dan, (laughs) what have you heard about gas stoves this week? Just give us the quick summary. That I better hang on to mine as tightly as possible because Joe Biden's coming to get it. Probably with his 87,000 IRS agents. Mm -hmm. You can't see it from the way this camera's positioned, but I'm currently chained to mine. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that sounds about right. Let's take a listen to a mashup Chris Hayes tweeted this week. The White House is now attempting to ban all gas ovens. Safety. Safety. <laughs> and your family dinner is about to get a lot less tasty. Hey, America is not going to stand for this. There's not. A stove like this one could be banned soon. Nobody's going to tell me I can't cook with gas. Do you like to cook with gas? Many people do. I do. Mm. Flavor of the food, if you can do it. It's reportedly like considering a... <laughs> Texas Congressman Ronnie Jackson, uh, Jackson writing in part, quote, I'll never give up my gas stove. If the maniacs in the White House come from my stove, they can pry it from my cold, dead hands. Strong feelings. Yeah. Strong feelings. Cold, dead hands. Were you all that outraged? 
Uh, I was more confused than yeah. anything. Yeah. So let's talk about what actually happened. The fury around gas stoves started on January 9th when a government official named Richard Trumka, who's the U.S. commissioner at the Consumer Product and Safety Commission, gave an interview to Bloomberg where he said that the government agency was considering a ban on gas stoves because they were a hidden hazard. And he also added that when it comes to gas stoves, any option is on the table. Products that can't be made safe can be banned. He was talking about some recent studies that found that gas stoves can emit nitrogen dioxide, methane, and other pollutants, which do pose some pretty serious health risks, including increased rates of asthma among children and also dementia in older Americans. As a resident asthmatic, that is a little bit concerning. Mm -hmm. um, the studies found that children living in households with gas stoves are 42 percent more likely to have childhood asthma and that gas stoves are actually directly responsible for almost 13 percent of all childhood asthma cases. And if those health risks aren't scary enough, studies have also found that climate emissions from gas and oil powered buildings make up 12 percent of all of our country's greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm going to pause there. Did you have any idea gas stoves were that dangerous? Zero idea. Yeah, me neither. I mean, I would have guessed that they uh, contribute something to global warming mm -hmm. uh, because gas. Yeah. Um, but I had no idea about the health effects. Yeah, me neither. Dan, did you know? I hadn't. I have to admit, I had not thought about it. And then when someone explained to me that you're going to burn methane in your house <laughs> when you cook. Yeah, yeah, that kind of makes sense when you think about it. Yeah, it's kind of <laughs> terrifying. So the CPSC followed up to clarify that they're only looking to make gas stoves safer. Um, and two days later, they added a statement saying, to be clear, we're not looking to ban gas stoves and the CPSC has no proceeding to do so. Now, I, I also think that um, I think I heard this, that even if they did, it would be a ban on new gas stoves. Yeah. They so th anyone who has a gas stove. They were never even floating the possibility that if you currently have a gas stove, you can no longer have that stove. Yeah, they literally can never go in your house and take your <laughs> gas stove. Like, no one is suggesting that. They're just letting us know that these are dangerous and maybe we can consider other options. Yes, um, if we're going to your home, we're going to take your gun. Yeah, exactly. Your gas stove. Yeah, gas stove is bottom of the list. Much, um, much heavier to take out of there. Yeah, and I can't tell why... The CPSC like gave this interview to Bloomberg. I can't tell why they made this news. That does feel like the biggest unforced error here. Like that was a mistake, I think. But I am curious. I don't think that was on the White House message calendar. Yeah, for that <laughs> it didn't make a lot of sense to me. Send but... out the Consumer Product Safety Commission to uh, just float a ban on the gas stove. Yeah, no one needed to do that that day. <laughs> but I'm wondering, when's the last time you heard about what the Consumer Product and Safety Commission was up to? Like. How do you think this was caught by so many conservatives? Um, Dan? Well, I, as a parent of two children, I'm like deeply aware of everything oh, the CPSC rec recalls because hmm. you get notifications for those things. Interesting. Um, so, I mean, there are people who watch it a lot okay. and pay attention to it. Um, those are generally people who want to keep dangerous products away from their children. Um, there's also obviously a group of people who troll the government for ways to find fake outrage to drive clicks in cable ratings, which mm. I think probably how this one came out. Yep. Yeah. And it's usually, um, the, the flavor of this is usually the government's coming to take something X. fundamentally American away from you. Yes. Oh, and we're going to get into that. <laughs> but first I want to talk about the outrage. Uh, Republicans, of course, went into a frenzy over this, and I know both of you were pretty plugged in to what they were saying, so I want to quiz you on some of the ways they spoke out this week. Are oh, you ready? Yeah, absolutely. All oh, right. Quiz. Pop quiz, if you will. Pop quiz. Which of these was not done by Republican trolls this week? A, did Republicans tape themselves to a gas stove in protest? B, did Republicans run all the burners and sit in their houses inhaling the gas to prove <laughs> a point? Or C, did Republicans start selling don't tread on me aprons with gas stoves to fundraise? I know I know that the last one happened. I'm going to say that they didn't um, turn on the stoves and inhale all the fumes. I, they did turn on the stoves and inhale all the fumes. I think it was the first. Trick question. All of those happened this week. Wait, they really inhaled the fumes? They really Who inhaled did that? the fumes. Who did that? Um, it was some, Nick, Ad some Nick Adams, right? Yeah. 
Dan, yeah. you are plugged in. Wow. I've, I am fucking riding a seven-week uh, two takes and a fake losing streak, so I've been I've been, I've been training like Rocky well, over here. I will say this. The um, the don't tread on me thing, That I, I think DeSantis yes. rolled that out. Yeah. And just a fun fact, 92% of all uh, stoves in Florida are electric yes. and not gas. So it is not even a yes. red state, real American phenomenon. It is a blue coastal ultra lib thing. Yeah. That's why that's why we have gas. Yes, stoves. exactly. We will get into that too. But more pop oh, quiz. Sorry, sorry to get ahead of it. <laughs> Who tweeted, imagine a world where all tortillas are heated <laughs> in the microwave. We must take a stand against this insanity. I will be joining my colleagues this week to introduce legislation that stops this stove war from happening. Do you know who tweeted that? Feels very Ted Cruz. Close. Yeah, it was, I would say that as well. was Representative Mike Garcia, uh, who I truly have uh, never heard of. That's the he's the one who you know, kept beating Christy Smith out here. Yeah, he he's oh. the he's the one walking around with the uh, never go ahead. Let's <laughs> <laughs> make a Christy Smith joke, but I won't. <laughs> Next one. Who went on InfoWars to say literally everyone prefers a gas stove? <laughs> And that regulating gas stoves are, quote, part of the globalist agenda for the Green New Deal and the most dangerous thing for our entire planet and all of humanity. Wow. Who went on InfoWars to say that? Who's like an InfoWars guest? Steve Bannon? Close. It's an obvious one. It is a representative. Matt Gaetz? Marjorie Taylor Greene. Oh. Oh. God damn. Our new oversight committee member. Exactly. And one more for you. Finally, which Republican tweeted, the federal government has no business telling American families how to cook their dinner. I can tell you the last thing that would ever leave my house is the gas stove that we cook on. Oh, that's Joe Manchin. Yep, that's, it was a trick question. It wasn't Davos, Republican. Davos Joe. Yep, it was Joe Manchin. Side note, do you think you can have a gas stove on a houseboat? I do not think you can. Yeah, yeah I, don't I don't know. I don't know. I don't know a lot about houseboats. Where does the gas line run? Unless you just have like a little well, tank, maybe a gas tank. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think it's a gas stove on the super yachts a below deck, so I don't know how that applies in this situation. <laughs> also, here, feels but... a little dangerous to have a gas tank on a on a boat, but exactly. Uh, John, how do you think the boat moves? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, uh, Dan, it's is... not just wind, my friend. <laughs> Dan's plugging gas right now. Not a sailboat. It's not a sailboat. <laughs> um, it wasn't just Republicans who freaked out. Kind of everyone got involved in this. Allison Roman, the controversial chef, tweeted, "I have an induction oven." <laughs> I have an induction stove by choice. Ask me anything. Just as a small side, please humor me. I'm deeply curious. Do either of you know why Allison Roman is controversial? Yeah, something we happened. Do we do know. Yeah. All right, no, cool. We were, we were here for that. It, I think, you're plugged. I think, I think, I, we're not even going to revisit it, but let it be known that we know. All right, cool. I feel like Lovett was involved somehow. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> um, Democratic representative Ruben Gallego tweeted, hot take, keep the gas stove and get rid of the air fryer. Only urban elitists use air fryers. Do either of you have air fryers? No. Really? I I have an Instapot that converts to an air fryer. That's Ooh, more elitist. That yeah, very, absolutely. Most elitist. You know what? Cooking food, good food quickly is not elitist. It's practical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Gallego's wife responded to that tweet saying, we have an air fryer, which you'd know if you did the cooking. Wow. Yeah. Airing their dirty laundry. And finally, my favorite tweet was by comedian Rob Delaney, who tweeted, you can have my gas when you pry it from my cold, dead ass. <laughs> So let's bring it back and answer the question that we started with. Is Joe Biden trying to take your gas stove? Now, doesn't, doesn't sound like it. Doesn't sound like it. Doesn't sound like he it. Is, he is not. He's not. And it it made me remember some like other controversies we've seen like this recently. I remember last year conservatives being really upset about liberals ruining hamburgers and Joe Biden being called the Hamburglar. Why do you think they latch on to outrages like this? Um, you know, because it, uh, it speaks to a fundamental fear the American people have. The government is going to be too big and too scary and take away things that are valuable to them. Conservatism and Republicanism is grievance politics. Mm -hmm. And it is about, it is about fear of change, trying to make change seem scary. And so that is liberal elites want to take your hamburgers away. They want to take your guns away. They want to change your way of life. And that has two purposes. Outrage has two purposes. One, when you represent a declining share of the American population, you need to keep your shrinking base at a fever pitch at all times. And in this media environment driven by cable 
and Facebook, outrage is the coin of the realm. It is what drives traffic. It's what causes liberals to react. And so there is a marriage between Republican politicians who want an angry base and right-wing media figures who want to use outrage to get filthy rich. Absolutely. I have a twist at the ending of all this, but I'm curious if there's anything either of you want to say about this myth that we haven't covered yet. I think we've nailed it. Sweet. Dan, nothing else you saw in your extensive research? Uh, no. All right. Well, the twist is that the Inflation Reduction Act actually includes rebates for households switching from gas to electric stoves. So not only is Joe Biden not taking your gas stove, he's trying to pay you money for buying electric stove. People that turn in their gas stoves and upgrade to an electric one will earn a rebate of $840 cash back. Unfortunately, when you try to give back your stove, they will inject you with a microchip. Yeah. And that's how COVID started. (laughs) They will force you to read Beloved. (laughs) Wow. Deep cut. Deep cut from 21. And I just want to end by saying, Republicans and all politicians, please don't take away our right to choose how to cook our dinners. (laughs) Um, Thank you, Olivia. Thank you for um, helping us bust that myth. (laughs) Thanks for having me. And, uh, And thank you to Sarah Longwell for joining us. Everyone have a great weekend, and we will talk to you next week. Bye, everyone. The Crooked Store has decided at long last to update our Friend of the Pod merch. They got that Yes We Dan stuff out of the way. Now there's more room for updated Friend of the Pod merch. <laughs> Not true. It's on a deep discount right now. I saw it's it on last deep night. Disc- you, can get a, you can get a hoodie for like half price right now. That's that's exciting. I might go order one myself. The new and improved pieces include classic t-shirts, crewnecks, and hats in fresh new colors. There's even some camo. So you can blend in with the forest and or your uncles who like hunting. Uh, I believe Lovett was wearing a camo friend of the pod hat just the other day. Uh, he looked fantastic. Anyway, it's all available now at crooked.com slash store. <laughs>